tonight, I have the tremendous pleasure of introducing another, another highly talented and intensely thoughtful artist, um, Arnie Svensson. I've been looking forward to hearing directly from Arnie Svensson since I first encountered the Modern's recent acquisitions from his The Neighbors series. And um, the more I have learned about Mr. Svensson and his highly nuanced work, the greater my anticipation. Having come to art unawares, as, um, he, he, as he puts it, from another career path, um, Mr. Svensson uh, seems to be on an insatiable mission to discover, know, and share or present his findings um, as his art practice has led him down numerous and varied paths of visual exploration, as I believe you will see in tonight's lecture. Clearly having the eye and the heart for making compelling images that um, understand their means as much as they know their method, uh, Svensson, um, a native of Marin County, um, California, lives and works in New York City a city he sees as being like no other, explaining that it resonates with a palpable pulse and that for whatever reason it attracts and enables me um, to access my creativity more readily. While he never photographs the streets of New York City, he says more valuably, he uses it as a lifeline to the vitality of his work. His bio states that first and foremost, his practice seeks out the inner life, the essence of his subjects whether they be human, inanimate, or somewhere in between, which I think is an interesting place, somewhere in between. Um, this fervor and undeniable talent has resulted in Arnie's work being shown extensively in the United States and Europe, um, and included in numerous public um, and private collections, including the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, three of which you can see on the second floor in the uh, cur current permanent collection exhibition. San Francisco Museum of Art, and the Carnegie Museum of Art. He is the author and photographer of a large number of books, including Prisoners, Sock Monkeys, 200 out of uh, 1,863, that he did with Ron Warren, and The Neighbors, of which you can find signed copies in our own uh, modern bookstore. And then there is the upcoming um, book, um, Unspeakable Likeness, um, oh, unspeaking likeness. That does change it, doesn't it? Unspeakable likeness, unspeaking likeness. Um, which, um, which is due actually to release in April. Um, but I have a little preview for you here. Just a little tease. I know, great response. That's exactly, that was my response. Okay, so this and then this on the back. So, yes. Oh, that's great. And um, with that response, I'm going to report that we definitely have to get that for the modern store. So be on the lookout. Um, again, it's released in April. Um, so um, Arnie's uh, solo museum exhibition, The Neighbors, just opened um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, which is where he's going after um, this lecture and giving another lecture there. Um, and his most recent gallery exhibition, The Workers, was last spring at the Julie Saul Gallery where Arnie's work is represented in New York. Um, he is currently working on a new body of work titled The Forest, shot in Sweden, that explores the, dichotom the dichotomous relationship between photography and painting, what he calls the sweet spot. Um, where perceived reality and fiction meet. Um, and um, it has just been announced, or recently announced, that Arnie is the nominee for the prestigious Nannen, uh, Nannen Prize, which is the German equivalent of the Pulitzer. Um, he's been, I know, exactly. <laughs> You guys are perfect. I told him you were the perfect audience. And you're just, you you're, all, you're performing in every way. Love you. Oh, love you back. Um, he's been, interestingly enough, nominated in the category of documentary photography, which I find really interesting. Um, we are in for something really special tonight. So please join me in welcoming Arnie Svensson. Thank you, Terry, and thank you everyone for coming. I've never been, well, I've never been to Fort Worth, 
except to the airport, and they rarely let me out, so I just kind of go somewhere. So to come to this museum was a revelation. It's an absolutely beautiful museum, and I hope you all appreciate it. And I am so happy to be in the collection. So thank you. Let me change my glasses. Oh, and, I, and thank you so much for that response to the book, because I haven't, I, today was the first day I saw it. And it's been in the works for eight years, so it's, it was a long gestation. Um, rather than concentrating on one body of work tonight, I thought I'd talk about a number of series I produced over the last 20 years or so. I photographed everything from sock monkeys, forensic facial reconstructions, Las Vegas, and the people across the street. My series are divergent, but connected in that I'm forever trying to make the unimportant important and the unseen seen. I'm kind of a cross between a reporter and a lifeguard, always looking for the decisive moment, as I did in the Neighbor series, or for a subject that is in need of resuscitation, as I did in the forensic facial reconstruction photos of which that book is, consists of. I also have a deep interest in implied narrative, in providing the viewer with indicators and hints of stories buried in my imagery. I feel like I'm the, I'm the one that creates the once upon a time, and then I expect you, I do expect a lot from my viewers, I expect the rest of you to complete that story based on the evidence that I'm giving you. I came to photography somewhat late. My background was in special education, and though I did take painting classes when I was working on my degree, I was not satisfied with my results. And they were terrible, to put it bluntly. Um, there, there was something missing, which I realized early on, not as early as I wish, but um, that it was the framework of reality. I need, it's like I'm more of a renovator than a builder. I need pre-existing conditions which to poke holes in and tangible imagery to, to look at in a way that you haven't looked at. That's my job, is to see the world the way that you don't see it and then bring it to you. As, I mean, that's my, my one gift. Um, after university, I, I worked for a while with development, developmentally disabled infants, which was great, but I felt, um, well, number one, I had to give it my all because you have to, and it's, that's, that's what you do. But I felt the creative side of me was being completely <coughs> muzzled and subsumed by this. So after a few years, I made the decision to leave my job and move to New York and learn photography, which given my sensibilities, I figured was the most appropriate medium for me to pursue. I began teaching myself in a strictly DIY manner. I read books I didn't understand, threw them away, and through trial and error, kind of finally tamed the camera, if you can ever tame the camera. To me, it's like a snarling beast in the corner that you somehow have to subdue to make it do your will. Otherwise, it's just like, I can't even look at it. In fact, I hide my camera when I'm not looking at it, using it. It's just, it's <laughs> hidden away in a box, and then I bring it out, and, you know. But anyway, I, I wasn't, I, I was doing, I was doing some stage portraits and, um, you know, self-portraits and stage stuff, and it really wasn't working. It, it, um, it wasn't saying anything. It wasn't speaking a language or creating a language. So in a fit of inspiration, I, I guess you'd call it that, um, I thought I'd send myself to photo camp but it was my photo camp, where I could teach myself the basics of photography. My partner, Charles, who is now my new husband, had a two-week job in, the, in Las Vegas. And I went with him, because I thought roaming around the desert with my camera might be just the inspiration I needed. So he rented an enormous Cadillac, because I love Cadillacs. And, and while he was at work, I'd drive around the outskirts of town looking for things to photograph. And my natural inclination was to go up into the hills. You know, because I thought a beautiful landscape 
was, um, ooh, what I should practice on, kind of the Ansel Adams school of thought, and get the light down, and get the shading down, and get the, the f-stop, whatever that is, down, and all, get all that stuff down. Um, so I headed up to this place called Red Rock Canyon, um, which, which is very pretty. Um, but I, I, I was using a two and a quarter at that point, a house of blood. And I got it all set up with the tripod and the whole thing. And I looked down and totally freaked out because there was nothing there for me. With all this beauty and the red rocks and birds, I mean, actually the birds were flying by and stuff. And it was, I don't know how to explain this, it was too beautiful and it was absolutely inflexible for, to kind of insert a narrative. It was just pretty. It was just a big rock that to me, were it food, would have no flavor and no layered nuance. So I packed up my camera, got back in the Cadillac, and drove back to the hotel. I was really disappointed because I thought I'd failed. Here I'd been so excited to do this and I was going to... I mean, not that I wanted to be Ansel Adams, but I wanted to figure it out and thought if I knew what he knew, then I could do anything I wanted, like kind of like magic. Um, but I was dragging myself back to the room. You know, it was like 500 degrees, and I was, you know, schlepping these bags. And I heard a strange noise, a kind of giant sucking sound. And I followed the source to what I considered a miraculous occurrence. The hot tub, which was enormous, had gone out of control, and this powerful liquid hurricane was whirling around in the center, but it was like this big. You know, if you'd tossed a dog into it, it would have gone immediately. <laughs> and crowds of people were staring at it, hypnotized, and I, at that moment I had my epiphany that this is what I was meant to photograph. The, the, that whirling water kind of embodied the mysterious, skewed negatives that I was searching for, and this is, this is that photo. So this was one of the first... John, can you take the lights down? But thanks. Um, this was one of the first photographs that I took that I really thought was mine, that I finally had owned. I tamed the camera, and I owned the image, and it was A in the alphabet. So after taking this picture, I didn't leave the confines of Las Vegas for a couple of weeks. And I mean, literally, I, didn't, I, I wouldn't even go out in the country. I mean, the country was dead to me because it had, nothing, it had nothing for me. So I just drove around looking for like weird occurrences and strange juxt juxtapositions. And also, I realized I didn't want people in my shots. A couple of people had wandered into something I was photographing. Um, I thought, this is not what I want. What I want is a Las Vegas where all the people have disappeared in some, you know, vaporizing thing where they all just disappear. Like three days before, and the city was just teetering on rotting. Because if you leave Las Vegas alone, it's, it's like a, a pet. If you leave it alone for a few days, it's going to start to, like, die. So that's that little... I, I usually make a statement... Um, about my work that defines my work. It's one sentence, and it's usually quite a secret sentence to myself. But that was kind of the, the overreaching idea on that. Um, this next picture is Hoover Dam. And I was at the airport photographing. And this one you could still photograph anywhere. You know, I just had like good posture and a big camera, and I just walked in anywhere. and. I discovered this and I thought, this is great. I don't have to go to Hoover Dam. I don't have to go outside and get in the car and, and, do, and try that, that failure again. And what I thought was really, I mean, it's, this is a beautiful model. And I love miniatures and, and taxidermy. And anytime someone has kind of subjectively constructed something from memory. And ironically, a few years later, I went back to the, to the airport to find this again. And it was all crumbled up in the corner. It was broken in half and just shoved in a corner, which, which speaks so much of like not only um, Las Vegas, but society in general, that it, it, it was over. Therefore, it was just shoved. This next one is my idea of a landscape. 
you know, it's inside, it's an air conditioning, it, it has all the components that I need. Um, it has, I, I, you're going to notice that I shoot very flat. I don't, it's funny, I was in the Kimball today looking at some like uh, 15th century paintings and realized that that's the sensibility I have. I never got as far as perspective. I can't go deep. So this has, as you see, planes. And it was in the convention center where I worked a lot, uh, you know, photographing. And this was a menswear show, and I believe there were mannequins on this dais thing. Um, but the, the, the way that the framework draws you into the forest, but then it draws you only as far as the curtains and the lights behind were to me just kind of a magical, magical um, positioning. And what was really weird is they had live leaves spread around the corner, you know, so it's, it's just like, you know, the Wizard of Oz forest. These were, I was driving around with a friend of mine in the Cadillac. And he lives in Las Vegas and performs there. And he knows everything. And he said, Arnie, you've got to come down to the Hilton basement, the third level down. And we went down. And this was the still life. These are these giant heads like this big that were animatronic heads with, with like gigantic bodies outside of the Benihana restaurant. And they had gotten rid of it and ripped the skin off of the things and then put them in the basement. And what was really interesting, when Teller and I were down there, um, and even before I started photographing, people were, were parking their cars and driving, you know, walking. No one noticed. No one saw this. And I think they were immune to fantasy that wasn't created with a direct directive to fantasize them. Do you understand that they, this was too out of the ordinary? It wasn't Aladdin's lamp, or it wasn't Caesar's palace. It was just like a corner of weirdness, and they just made it go away. This was a shot that I took early on, um, and it is a putting, uh, an astroturf putting green that for some reason had a sprinkler system, which, you know, go figure, but, um, and it was flooding. So the thing was flooding. So that's the, the grid there is the Hilton Hotel um, reflected in it. And it was just growing. Soon after this, the whole thing was submerged. And I, again, I love this artificiality of the astroturf that merely by touching the water kind of turned it artificial. Because it really looks like it was photoshopped in or laid in, but it's just, it's just resting on green plastic, essentially. This is an area, this is what, Vegas does this a lot. They try to hide things behind curtains and lattice work and stuff. And I love this because not only the symmetry of it, but that they're trying to hide the air conditioning ducts by putting something equally as ugly <laughs> in, in front of it. And then they had these giant barriers that would prevent us from getting to the ugly thing. And again, you'll see the planes that I work in. You don't see much dimension in this work. This was, uh, this was a, in the convention center again. I mean, I really was like a groupie. I just hung out there all the time. And this is a magazine kiosk that, you know, had all these slots and magazines would fit into it, and it was completely out of control. It was spinning so fast that nobody could get a magazine out of it. <laughs> And, and this is a very short exposure. This is maybe a 30th, which tells you exactly how fast that thing was going. So these are the things, again, that I was looking for. And if you really look closely, they're absolutely everywhere. This is the Liberace Museum. And again, this is as far as outside as I would go. And I like the manicured lawn or whatever that is, tundra. I don't know what that is. And then, it, and then the horizon line I thought was pretty spectacular because of the curvature of the earth. And then up above it was just music. And it seemed so, I don't, I don't know, it seemed so absolutely natural to me. The last one in the Vegas series is uh, Socrates. 
And so, as, well, as one should end everything with, but um, this was in Caesar's palace. And we're going back like 20 years now. And it was a giant, it was marble, and it was in a bank, big banquette. And there was people, you can't see them because I had to wait and wait and wait, because what they would do is they would sprawl on the banquette, mimicking his posture, and start yelling about the drunk dude. So Socrates became the drunk dude. Ultimately, he proved like not to be very popular, so they got rid of him. And the next year I went back, because I would go back early, by the way, and he, there, there are hundreds of images of Las Vegas, which I think is going to be my next book. Um, anyway, I went back, and he was gone, and the Venus de Milo had replaced him. But it was Venus de Milo with arms, which is a, you know, was a very unique look. And absolutely, for me, uninteresting to photograph. So that was a, a tiny sliver of Las Vegas. Again, I'm going to maybe confuse you by this kind of uh, very discordant bunch of work, but it, 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 there is a consistency through it. The next series is called Faggots, which I did about 15 years ago. And this was a site-specific project for the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, which is the museum there. And there were about 70 images in the show. The series was instigated by a single weird incident, and a, a, a sad incident. My partner, Charles, and I were spending the summer in Nantucket, and we were outside weeding and working in the yard. And a truck drove by, and the window was rolled down, and someone yelled, faggot. And I yelled back, who, me? And the guy in the truck said, no, him. And I said, him? And he said, him, meaning Charles. And then he drove away. And this was you know, sad in that you know, God knows it should never happen, but like hysterical in a way. Um, but I, I started thinking, what is, it, what is it that made Charles the faggot and not me? You know, being that we're both gay, obviously. And I, I process a lot of, I process everything from my work, so I thought I'd do a, a project, you know, the one, the Gray Gallery, and it's, and it's called Faggots. And what I did was I asked one gay friend, this guy, to come to my studio and stand on a mark on the floor, look at the camera without gesturing and being as neutral as possible. So to give no indicators of whatever those gay indicators are, the, you know, I don't know, flouncy hand or you know, nothing. And to just stand there. And I took only two images. I took one and a safety because I didn't want to be tempted to edit and edit into beauty or edit into handsomeness or edit into something I was seeing. I was just like a recording machine. You know, it's kind of taxonomy. I just was like recording, recording, recording. I took one photo and then asked him if he'd recommend somebody else. And this way I got like 70 men to pose. And they were complete strangers. I didn't, I didn't even want to inflict my editing on, on the selection, so I had other people select. And you know, the, the interesting thing is uh, I don't have an answer to my question because I don't know what denotes queerness in a neutral environment. Would the truck driver call this kid a faggot and not this guy? I have no idea. I mean, sometimes you ask, you ask questions with your work and nothing comes back, just an echo of your own question. One, one interesting thing about this was at the Gray Gallery, which is an enormous space, and this took over the whole, the whole museum space, there was a big sign saying faggots. I mean, a big sign over this. And this was like gay week or something, and I, I was hanging out there, because I like to listen to what people say about my work without identifying myself. And so many guys came in, again, walking under the faggot sign, and looked around and said, where are the faggots? 
And so it's almost like, and I know this sounds strange, but one's own species was not recognizing one's species. And I don't even know what to make of that. So you see, it was just, it was, um, that got a rise out of some people, I have to admit. Okay, since this is a short history of my career, I can't avoid talking about sock monkeys. All right? This is, a, this is a project I did right after Faggots, and it started when a curator friend of mine said I, that I had to see this crazy collection of almost 2,000 sock monkeys. Now, a sock monkey, in case you don't know, was a doll that was made out of work socks. Um, it started in the 40s and the 50s, and it was usually made by grandma or a mother, and, and mostly in families who could not afford a toy for their kids. So, they, so th to me, they were made with love and affection. And my friend collected, yeah, it was almost 2,000. Um, 1,863, actually, is what it was. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting to photograph all 1,863. So, but I wanted to do it in the style of classical portraiture. You know, but individually, each one, one at a time. And I wanted to see if through photography, and no, no tricks, just by how we photograph them and how empathetically we pose them, I want to see if we could ref bring them back to that love thing status, which was probably so important to them. I wanted to see it as a child sees it and elevate it to a position of major importance worthy of a, you know, worthy of a formal, almost noble portrait. And they were a good size, about, about this big. I shot it in black and white in order to play down the uh, toyness of them and to force the viewer into looking at them as individuals with unique expressions and attributes. I also shot them, as you notice, kind of dead on so that they looked really large. And the actual prints were life-size, human head life-size. And also I focused on, which is something I've, I've, I've used throughout the rest of my career, I focused the lens on the eyes, or, or buttons in this case. Um, and let the rest of the face fall away into out of focus. And you'll see that in my next series, too. And this is how we see. I really pr I went to the Met and stared at portraits. And I got very, very close and realized I was looking right at the eyes and everything else was disappearing. And so that's what I used with these. It became, um, we made a book called Sock Monkeys 200 out of 1,863 which sparked a kind of crazy phenomena. The series in the book became immensely popular and seemed to straddle the fragile line between high and low art. The subsequent shows were reviewed in art magazines like Art Forum and Art in America in a very, in a very serious way, but also in People, Entertainment Weekly, and The Knitting News. <laughs> um, we were even invited, by the way, to be the Grand Marshals in the annual Sock Monkey Parade in Rockford, Illinois, where the Sock Monkey originated, which was, was a great honor. I couldn't go, but Ron went and rode in the, in the, in the float. Um, we, had a, we, we did a lecture in Philadelphia, and it was um, about the work, and it was at the um, Institute of Contemporary Art there. And it was a crowd like this, but it was completely packed. And I saw Robert Storr there, who was the head of MoMA at the time. And there was an empty seat next to him, and then a woman next to him with a sock monkey shirt on. And I couldn't understand why that seat was, was empty, and so I finally kind of peeked. And either he or she had brought their sock monkey <laughs> and had put it in that seat between them. And. Yeah, that said everything to me. I, I, I love it when my work stops off in the art world but then goes somewhere else because I think that the narratives are so extraordinarily different in each venue and at, at each stop. The next 
Oh, more. I mean, I mean, you could see how I could not not photograph them, you know. And it was funny because a lot of people said, well, you know, you're a serious artist, what are you doing? And I just said, I'm taking portraits. And that's what I was doing, I'm taking portraits. The next work, and this is the work that's in that new book, is called Unspeaking Likeness. And let's see if I got that, yes. I applied the same methodology that I had used in the Sock Monkeys for this, por for this project. And it is portraits of forensic facial reconstruction sculptures. And I'm going to read you the official definition of that. When only skeletal remains exist, these sculptures are commissioned by law enforcement agencies to determine the identity of victims involved in violent crimes. Using statistical averaging of tissue, muscle, and skin depth, an artificial face made of clay or plaster is constructed by a forensic artist to better aid in the identification of the victim. After construction, the sculpture is photographed and the image is broadcast in the hopes of getting identification. For about three years, I traveled around the country to coroner's offices and law enforcement agencies photographing examples of these reconstructions. I usually had to work in really difficult situations, sometimes just a few, weeks for, a few steps away from autopsies. And, and a lot of the uh, medical examiners, as a rite of passage, would take me through an active autopsy room in order to test to see if I could stomach it. And I, I somehow did. It's amazing what you can not see when you're looking. Um, I, I, I also went in the midst of all this to Juarez and photographed reconstructions of six women whose bodies had been found in a mass grave. You know, there's a, that, that hideous um, situation where like five, six, seven hundred women have gone missing and murdered in the last 10, 15 years. And I was brought down there to photograph these to see if we could identify some of these women. Um, that was, and I won't go into that tonight, but that was one of the most difficult shoots in my life and one of the most difficult times in my life, working with these, being, I was literally locked in a room for eight hours a day with six dead women's heads and armed guards on either side of me. It was, uh, I, I still think about it. Um, Again, trying to reanimate that which has been lost or abandoned, I approached photographing these subjects as, as, as if they were living, breathing beings sitting for a portrait session. The sculptures normally stop at the neck. They just go like right here, and the cops photograph them by holding them up like this. And I, I thought that was so disrespectful because you have to understand the actual victim's skull is underneath this clay. Right? So the dead woman's skull is, is in there. And I think that great respect should be paid. So what I did was I built shoulders for them. I built the semblance of a body. I was trying to bring them back to life. Again, I'm resuscitating and reanimating. And then I dressed them in my clothes. I didn't have anything else. And I was making shoulders out of paint cans or paper towel, anything I could do to build up a bulk. And, and like the sock monkeys, I, I focused on the eyes again, and let the rest fall away, because that, even, that made it realer. And, you, and, and it, it's, it's, is it clay? Is it real? Is it a, is it a mask? I, I love that ambivalence that just like, you know, weaves through. I'm going to read you, uh, I think I have the time. Uh, yes. I'm going to read you, I was going to do three, but I'm going to do two. Um, descriptions that are in the book, and it's data that I collected about these people. And we'll talk about this one. The victim was discovered fully clothed on, on a beach near Blackie's Pasture in Tiburon, California, on September 26, 1979. She was wearing a black short sleeve knit blouse, pentimento brand beige pants with red and blue piping on the back pockets, blue bikini panties with flowers, and high-heeled wooden shoes, size 8. 
The date of death was September 26, 1979, the same day her body was found. She had been beaten, stabbed numerous times in the chest with something similar to an ice pick, doused with acetone and set on fire, then shot in the back of the head. Her face was burned beyond recognition. In 2006, the reopened cold case yielded an, yielded an identification of the victim. Using a hair gathered 27 years prior at the crime scene, a DNA match was discovered and Tammy Vincent was named as the murder victim. 17-year-old Tammy was last seen in Seattle, Washington on September 10, 1979. She had been subpoenaed to appear before an inquiry judge investigating a prostitution ring in the Seattle area, but disappeared from protective custody before she could testify. It is suspected that the men running the prostitution ring had ties to the San Francisco area, which is near where her body was found. In reviewing old case files, detectives learned that a witness who worked at a Woolworths in San Francisco recalled a mysterious man in a white leisure suit coming into the store that summer with a girl matching Tammy's description and purchasing acetone paint and an ice pick. So obviously she had been in the room when they were purchasing the weapons that, that murdered her. Uh, the investigation into the murder of Tammy Vincent is ongoing. You can see why this was very difficult. I'm just going to go through a few of these, and uh, and some like this is an unidentified man. And again, in the book, I have where he was found and what condition he was found. This woman was found in an abandoned house, and it was just a skeleton with a scarf. This, um, this is very short. The victim's skull, ribs, and vertebrae were found on September 26, 1974, near the Mill Valley Golf Course in Mill Valley, California. Clothing and effects found nearby consisted of green nylon Dacron windbreaker, a green white striped knit shirt, a blue t-shirt, and a red lady big, ladybug stick pin. And that was all too that was left of this child. I dressed him, by the way, in a shirt that was replicating what he was found in. If I, could, if, I could, if I knew what they were found in, I tried to find something that was similar. This is one of the Juarez girls, uh, Veronica, who ultimately was identified. Anna Duval, also identified, murder victim. And, and this, I don't think I have time tonight to read you this. Um, how much time do I have? Can I do it? Yes. Okay. Okay. I heard one read it, and I'm taking that. <laughs> On February 25th, this is, this is my girl, by the way. On February 25th, 1988, a group of boys playing football behind Central High School in Philadelphia tripped over the decomposed body of a young woman. The remains were little more than a skeleton clad only in a beige ship and shore blouse. Because of the decomposition of the body, the date and cause of death were unable to be determined. In 1990, Lois Brown was cleaning an office building and happened upon a flyer in the trash announcing an exhibition of forensic facial reconstruction sculptures at the Mutra Museum, which is a medical museum in Philadelphia. She noticed a resemblance of one of the illustrated reconstructions to her niece, Rosella Atkinson, who at age 18 had disappeared with, without a trace on October 12, 1987. Ms. Brown made her way that was like three years after. Ms. Brown made her way to the exhibition, and this was her first time she'd ever gone to a museum, and studied the forensic sculpture for over an hour. Gradually, she said, I began to see Rosella, and I began to see Rosella, Rosella's mother, Ferdinia, and Rosella's grandmother. I began to see the lines of the family. Other family members went to the college of the museum over the next few days and all agreed on the resemblance to Rosella, but were skeptical that it was actually she. 
Ultimately, a forensic dentist confirmed a positive identification of Rosella by comparing her dental records with the teeth of the skull. Eighteen years later, in September 2005, Brian Hall, 53, walked into a local police station and confessed to having strangled Rosella after an altercation on the night she disappeared. He told police, my conscience is eating at me, and I know it's time to get it right. I see her face all the time. On January 26, 2007, he was convicted of third-degree murder and faces 10 to 20 years in prison. And one little postscript to that is the New York Times did an article on my project and, and used Rosella as, as the, main, the main lead in, the, in the, you know, the main picture. And it was the same week that Brian Hall confessed. And I don't know if there's any connection or if it's a mad coincidence, but I don't know. I felt that I had helped Rosella. I, I, I became very, very uh, attached to all of these people. And so I, I, I feel that something happened. I hope. Now, the neighbors. Uh, the seven-story building across the street from my studio is constructed of floor-to-ceiling glass. Even the bathrooms have nothing but glass. It was built about five years ago on what had been a vacant lot, so where before we had a view of the sky, now all the residents in my building have a view of all the residents in that building. A few years after the condo went up, I inherited a telephoto lens from, from a photographer friend of mine. Given the type of work I do, there was just, I had no use for it and was just going to pack it away or donate it to charity. But then something interesting intervened. Fate. When I glanced across the street, I started noticing patterns in the behaviors of the people in the apartments because their blinds were like up all, all the time. Um, in particular, there was one couple who every weekend would sit in chairs right up against the window and have breakfast or read the paper or whatever. Because of the southern facing orientation of the building, it's kind of a southwest orientation, the light that was streaming into this scene was, was breathtaking and, and almost painterly. It, that's a drug to me. Light like that is an absolute drug. This is... Being an artist, or being me, uh, there was no way I wasn't going to photograph this scene, or others like it, because I'd seen similar things going on. So I figured out how to use that damn lens, and began taking pictures. And this being one of the first shots that I took, I mean, they did this every weekend, so I had time to practice. And at this point, people always ask me, um, weren't you concerned that you were photographing your neighbors without their knowledge? And I can honestly tell you that it never occurred to me that there would be an issue and that there would be consequences to this action. Because all I could see was the beauty of the imagery. And I think this is a gift that artists have. They have a blind spot, and they're the ones that the, the photograph is so beautiful that they back up to get a better view and go off the cliff because they don't know the cliff is there, which is essentially what happened to me, by the way. But um, and quickly, I realized a few things, actually, about shooting the way I was shooting. First, I could only photograph a daylight scene that was smack up against the window because the light fall off would be so dramatic if the subject was even a few feet from the glass. So in other words, I had to photograph that which was really seen by not only my building, but by the street below. Because I'm only on the second floor, and I was shooting into the second, third, and fourth floors of this building. So everything that I was seeing was being seen by the street also, because it was just right there. Um, then I found... I played a lot around with the focus. I found if I focused directly on the dirt, on the window, because you know, it's New York, so it's dirty, 
It kind of refracted and distorted the scene, making it appear as though this imagery was embedded in the, in the glass. And I don't know if you can get that from the slide, but again, it, and it also flattens it out. It's almost like a rear projection. It didn't, it didn't look real to me. And thirdly, and this is why I'm leaving this up, by the way, I began using the window mullions, you know, those thingies that, that divide the glass, as a framing device, and kind of dividing the visual surface into different sections. This established a structure um, and almost a, a required viewing area, drawing the eye to each discrete section. This image is also, this particular one is, is reminiscent of an altarpiece triptych to me. A lot of, a lot of this work references painting. Um, I don't know if it's by accident or by whatever the billions of paintings I've seen started seeping out of me into this, but there is the Vermeer and the Delacroix and Edward Hopper and Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, you know, there's all of these different references that weave through these, these narratives. But what I discovered and what I found to be most important was that I wanted to record the behaviors that were the most subtle and anonymous. There were indicators of, of who we are, but not who the subject specifically is. So I photograph people going about their domestic lives, but only show you the back of a head or posture of an arm, and never identifying the subjects, never showing a recognizable face. To show identity would have sabotaged the potential narrative embedded in the imagery. I wanted to convey an infinity of, po of possible situations and emotions and hope that, that you, the viewer, feels as though they are not looking through a window but staring at a mirror. These, I'm just gonna go through these and not say anything, <laughs> maybe, except. Um, <laughs> some of these, it's very subtle, are self-portraits because the red, I don't know if you can see it in this, but you can see it in the print, all the red background is my brick building. So many, many times I was reflected in this. And this is a very good example of, of how the light rakes across, and I would wait. You know, there were so many components, like in this photograph, I had to wait for, had to wait for the light to go, they had to wait for her to hold the teddy bear. And eventually I had something in my mind and they, they just fell into place, which was luck. This is a different version than the one that's hanging upstairs. There were two versions. Um, this is the original one, and then when I went back and saw the other one, with the pregnant woman with the, with the glass of water, which if you haven't seen it, um, is my favorite, is that one. It's one of my favorite photographs because it, it, it's so, to me, empathetic. So I thought these were very empathetic and gracious to the people I was photographing. They tended to see that somewhat differently. Um, this is the girl with the pearl earring. I mean, it, you just, what can you do? You have a woman with a towel on her head and her device, and the right lighting, <laughs> and the right lens, and you have a mirror. And I knew I had that when I, some of these I knew I had something right away. This, this I was actually shooting the curtain, because I thought it was so lush, and she came in and started trying on different raincoats. And it became, it became a, a, a very good shot, I think. And again, it's so anonymous. This is the same giraffe that, by the way, features in quite a few of these images. I don't know why it keeps showing up. And a lot of times I was only able to capture people because they were so still because they were on their devices or they were lit by their devices. This, this I think, is just a universal behavior. <laughs> Alone at home, twirling your hair. 
And they, these, these shoot, shoots were very, very, very difficult because I was doing five and 10 second exposures and just hoping for the best. And a lot of times I was shooting into the blackness because I couldn't see anything. <laughs> this, ironically, is the only creature that in a year and a half of photographing ever noticed me. <laughs> because you have to realize, I'm not that far away from everybody. I have a lens the size of a Buick, you know, <laughs> that I'm behind. And my window is open. And I, I will never understand why only the little dog saw me. Every once in a while I would do a still life, and this was one of my absolute favorites. It was, this was, I think, a little girl, maybe a little kid, I know, a girl boy, her toy, you know, her toy skull. And I, I just thought it was very suitable for my work. This one, I love the mystery of this, and I love the, uh, the color of it. And what those windows did, because sometimes I'm shooting through four or five layers of glass, I'm shooting through my own double windows, and they had triple pane windows. So it just diffused, 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 diffused. And each time it diffused, it changed the color, it changed the perspective, it changed something. It was like a prism, a prism, a prism. This, <laughs> the New York exhibition of the neighbors created an intense media frenzy. And to say it went viral is an understatement. It went um, universally just crazy. Um, when it was discovered which building this was that I was photographing, within a day, all the news vans with those big radar things come up and Diane Sawyer and this one and that one were trying to get interviews with me and people were writing really um, strong opinions of the work. Mostly I found out later before seeing the work. Um, anyway, this particular photograph um, sparked a lawsuit. The parents of this girl, I don't, I don't know if you can see what this is, it's hard to see, but it's a, it's a woman holding a little girl, kind of like a, a putti, and then whose, whose hand is falling down, and she has red hair. Anyway, they sued me, claiming invasion of privacy and, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. But because, and this is an enormously long story, but I'm, it's going to be three sentences. Um, but because there's no privacy laws in New York, the only way they could sue me was to claim I was using the images taken without their knowledge for advertising or trade. It's a very specific statute. However, this statute cover, that covers these issues contains a fine art exclusion which in tandem with the First Amendment rights of free express, expression protected my work, but my attorneys had to go to court to prove I was an artist. And we won the case, and within a day, the people appealed. It then went to a five-judge appellate court and was in that court for a year and a half. And then again, it was finally decided in my favor. And a lot of people asked me why I kept this up and didn't settle because it was, I can tell you, it was a very terrible time. It was very, and I was being vilified from all, from all sides. Um, well, one of the issues, by the way, is that the, the week that this show came out was the week that Snowden revealed the NSA secrets. And I think people saw my work as the manifestation of their fears of loss of privacy. So suddenly I became the bad guy. Um, anyway, but it was resolved in my favor. And the reason I, I stuck it out was I thought, what if I didn't have the reputation I have? What if I was 26? and didn't have work in museums and didn't have like, you know, a billion reviews and stuff. And the wherewithal to fight this, by the way, financially, what would have happened? 
to that person. And so that's why I fought it, because they would have, a kid would have been run over. And I mean, I was run over, but a kid would have been destroyed. So anyway, so that's, but now they've gone to the state legislature trying to get a ruling, I got, a, got a new law passed where you can't photograph in somebody's window in their domicile, which is insane, of course, because if I'm taking a picture of you and there's a window behind you and you know Susan is in that window, theoretically, Susan can sue you. So I, I'm hoping that this will not pass. Now, I know, I'm, I know, I know I have a minute. Um, we're going to fly to this next one. During the same time that I was photographing the neighbors, just to get myself in you know, enormous amounts of trouble, um, I started shooting the workers. <laughs> and, but this time I took the camera and, and the you know, gigantor lens outside and photographed construction workers through the windows of their work sites. Again, I did it without their knowledge. Because I truly believe that informing a subject that I was going to photograph them changes the dynamic completely. It becomes a collaborative project and a staged event rather than me being able to catch just this serendipitous movement. And I chose the oval format not only to denote a window, but as a way to kind of ennoble the subjects within. I thought it would make an interesting counterpoint to the neighbors whom we see at leisure. Uh, the buildings are expensive, by the way, the glass one. Um, and we said workers engage in physical labor, and I, that sentence I say to myself was, I'm portraying the pyramid builders as the pharaohs. And it was ironic that when this came out, and there was a, and there was a show, and it got a lot of press, but it got, it got art press. It didn't get... Dr. Phil and, you know, and, and, and the Post and all that. And I think it was because, I think it's a class issue. I think we're dealing here with Puerto Rican and Dominican workers, and nobody cared. So, which was part of the reason I did it. Only God will judge me if you need to read that. This is my Icarus picture. And that's that. The end. Do we have like three minutes for questions? Does anyone have a question? Let me put my question glasses on. <laughs> yes, whoever it was. With those workers, I was thinking about Andre Serrano and his images, the nomads mm. in the 80s where he was photographing homeless people. Were you thinking at all about him? No. <laughs> I, um, you know, it's funny, I, I, since I don't have a background in art, and I've never taken an art history course, and I rarely go to museums except to study um, something very, very specific. I don't, I have rarely ever used another artist as reference point. I think this is when I said that I didn't go to art school, and maybe there's pluses or minuses. Um, I miss perhaps not having a peer group because I know so few photographers, but I also believe my work is, is non-derivative and comes from a very different place. Yes. Kind of to continue with um, that question, um, the, um, the Serrano, pieces are, are very staged. You know, he brings right. them into yeah. the studio. Yeah, I know the pieces. Yeah. yeah. So, 
how how would you see? I mean, conceptually, what would be the difference? You sort of you touched on this already, I think, but could you just expound a little bit on the difference between the staged and the captured, maybe, or however you would put that? I think we can put it. We can frame it in in uh, the word truthfulness. And. I am not a fan of staged photography because I still am naive enough where I'm looking for truth in my imagery, and I think that I have a better chance of catching it, of the true motion of a person. And I'm talking almost physical motion of a person without telling them that I'm doing it. So this hand, if I tried to stage this, it would become, I think, extraordinarily contrived because I would start thinking of references of, oh, the king is dropping his handkerchief, or the, you, you know what I mean, in some kind of historical reference point. And I can't think, I don't know how to think like that. You know? And I, and I do believe in the decisive moment, yeah. in Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment. That's the one thing I learned, by the way. Um, that, and it's an old-fashioned idea in a way, but I think it's a really important idea. I don't know if that answers that or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes. What was your secret sentence during the neighbors? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I mean, sometimes a secret sentence is a secret sentence, you know? You, you, you have to understand also, this is the first time in three years, the, tonight, that I have been able to talk about the neighbors. Because I had, um, every time I spoke or was interviewed, I, it ended up in court papers against me. So my attorney advised strongly that I not do any kind of lecturing. And I'm still, frankly, very circumspect about what I say. And I have, I have that, what I do say, vetted. So there's certain... It was a very serious time, you know, because they, they were unrelenting in trying to win. And that's, that takes a psychic toll, it takes a financial toll, it takes an enormous toll. When you're fighting, when you're fighting for your art, it's a really slippery slope. Well, if, I, if I could just make a follow-up comment. I noticed you shared a lot of your secret sentences with us, and, and I recognize that's a vulnerable part of your art making, so I appreciate that you shared so many of those with us. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised I did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Can you, can you just uh, expand a little bit on the function of the secret sentence? Uh, just elaborate a little bit on that. What the it's, 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 it's a... Um, do you know when you're sailing and you're trying to keep your bow on a spot, I mean, that's the point when you're sailing, you're, you know, you go off and then you have to bring your bow back to a certain spot. And that spot is that sentence because I tend to go off the tracks a lot and get excited. I'm like a, like a cat that sees something shiny and I'll go run after it. And so the sentence draws me back. And like the sentence that I'm using, and I can tell you this, for this new series called The Forest, is, and this is a sentence that I give, uh, I give this to my printer. I have a, I have a big printer and I print, you know, like a, a prototype print, maybe two by three feet. Then I take it to my printer and he makes these gorgeous prints like what are upstairs. And the sentence I have given him about the forest is, there's a little girl and she's lost in the forest and she never makes it out. And that is what he uses as a color palette, if that makes any sense, a color and a lighting palette. And when he puts up a print, because he'll make a huge print, and I'll say, 
I think she can make it out of that. <laughs> and so we go back. So that's, that's, that's an example of what it is. It's really helpful. Yes? I want to say two things. Uh, one thing, the, they use the word mantra. It's the same thing. It's just a yes. secret word. And it brings you back, refocuses you every time you move out. And the second thing is, if I know that I'm being photographed, my body language changes. It's so, very different. Right. Absolutely. Different. Absolutely. It's like, if you're being photographed, you don't own your body anymore. Yeah. I, own, I own it. You know, and that's something I didn't want. I wanted full ownership in the subject. Yes? Well, and sort of uh, further extra extrapolation on this idea that in America, which we have the most litigious society that's ever graced this planet, uh, unlikely that you would have been sued almost anywhere else in the world for doing your art. Um, uh, but I'm thinking even in America, uh, if you were in small towns or out, you know, away from the great cities, uh, the likelihood of being sued, again, is reduced greatly. I'm wondering if you'd gone up to someone after you'd photographed, because I agree with you, you said your body language changes. Right. You, you can't take a, a natural picture of if you're going to ask them before the fact. But after the fact, after you've taken the pictures, say, you know, I, I really wanted to take a picture, and I'm glad to do a copy or something like that. Uh, I was... I would think that would renew, re, reduce or remove a lot of the difficulty. No, you don't think so. I love that little bastion of naivete there. Um, <laughs> now, they would not have, I don't believe, would have granted me permission. And at that point, I would have had to be in a position of asking, position, uh, asking permission where the law was on my side and I didn't need to. Do you know what I mean? And there were some people in that building on the other side that wasn't facing me that I heard later said, oh, I wish I had been on the side that you were taking the photographs. Because I did offer these people, you know, a photograph. And no one took me up on it, but, you know, so. Yeah, I hear you. Can I... Um can you talk a little bit about uh, maybe the kind of the relationship that you develop with the the subject? Um, the neighbors makes me think of it because um, you know we we all like you know at night. So you take a walk down the street and people's blinds are open and you sort of fantasize about what that that story is in that window or what that life is. And it's just, it's a natural place for us to go. But also beyond that, which feels a little voyeuristic, there, there's kind of a connectedness, like a reminder that we're all in our places doing our thing and that we're not that different, that we're all, we share this. We're doing this, that, that's what I meant when I said I wanted you to think that this, uh, this is a mirror. Uh -huh. And this is why I didn't use faces. And I mean, legally, I could have had their faces in this, but I wanted your face in the window. Do you know what I mean? I wanted your face reflecting back, even though it wasn't there, just kind of symbolic, reflecting back and saying, I, um, I know these people because these people are me. And I wanted this empathetic, an empathetic force field that would break through the glass. Do you know? and reach in to these people and say we are all, uh, we all understand twirling our hair and, and thank you for being the embodiment of it. Again, it's not quite how it was seen. But, and, but there's so much about those images, in well, all of them, but um, that is, I don't know, it's, you know, that story follows your first response me, which is just, it's, it's the beauty of the image, but there's, I don't know, there's something else. It's like, it's a connectedness, but, and all of the thinking about it follows. That's what I think is the success of that work, is that 
you first you experience it, then you see it, and you begin to break it down and think about it. Yeah, it's 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 one of my most layered mm -hmm. work. I think the most layered work I've done is the neighbors and the forensics, mm -hmm. because there are it, they are onions, and you're looking at them, and with the neighbors, you have this overarching thing saying, "Oh my God, he stole their privacy." It was almost as if I had stolen the souls. And then once you get past that, you see something completely different. Then you start seeing yourself in there, and then you start saying, thinking, well, wait a minute, what did he steal? He didn't steal anything. You know, it's, it's tied, more than any other work I've ever done, it's tied into the process. The process was condemned. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people couldn't get to where you are with the actual beauty of the images. And I admit that they're beautiful, which sounds kind of, I don't know, snotty, but but it was like they made themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it just was this light. I mean, you would have died. I mean, you know, it just was, was um, godly, you know?